It finally happened, everyone. If you somehow missed it, last week at Space Create Day 2023, Nate Simpson, creative director of Kerbal Space Program 2, unveiled the game's first roadmap feature release. This December, we're releasing our first major roadmap update, which we're calling For Science. So there you have it. Now, so far, you may have only seen recordings of the presentation, which do a bit of a disservice to the image quality, or, you know, seeing the odd screenshot shared on X, forever Twitter in our hearts. But as you know, I am a paid corporate shill for Take-Two Interactive, and during my latest delivery of a bucket full of money, I received some super high-quality gameplay footage from Boar Science, as well as some high-resolution screenshots. Let's talk about that in this my ultra deep raw analysis of KSP2 for science. I want to start with this clip here. It's of a rover driving towards the edge of a crater on the moon. It looks like the moon, but how can I be sure it definitely is? Well, let's switch to a high resolution screenshot and enhance. Now down there appears to be a crashed spaceship, but it's not just any spaceship. Right? If we brighten up the shadows to give us a clearer outline, well, I'd say that looks an awful like the man or bust crashed spaceship from the title screen of KSP-1. New easter egg just dropped everyone. <laughs> I'm hoping the devs also added that little sandcastle that will sometimes show up on the KSP menu as well. What does this mean? Well, during Nate's reveal, sorry, gonna switch to camera filming a screen footage again, so you can hear this little soundbite. Adding to the thrill of exploration, there are now several dozen new hidden points of interest across the Kerbola system, what we call discoverable, that yield additional science if you can find them. Yep, new Easter eggs are definitely confirmed. We also have this clip of a plane flying through what looks to be the skeletal remains of a Leviathan-class life form washed up and half buried on the shores of Laith. Perhaps KSP-2's equivalent dead Kraken Easter egg. So, one of the most compelling things to do on the surface of a planet or moon in Kerbal Space Program 1 is, well, doing science. But KSP-1 is kind of an old game now, and Science Gathering was a very early addition, so it was a little rough around the edges. For example, clicking Collect Surface Sample just gave you a pop-up notification saying, essentially, sample collected, which was nice. But looky here, this animation appears to show a Kerbal gathering a surface sample on the moon in a cute little sample collection tube and everything. Also, in the background, you can see a lander, and that piece below the decoupler and above the fuel tank is, I'm pretty sure, the new revamped look for the Science Junior. This part was always kind of clunky in KSP-1, so it's really cool to see it get more aesthetically aligned with the look of the other components in KSP-2. In fact, I don't even know why I said I'm pretty sure. It is literally shown in this screenshot in the VAB. We also got a look at the Kerbal Space Center's mission control. Career mode and science mode from KSP-1 are going to become basically merged, where there's no money system, but rather a science point system. And it looks like whoever is playing this save has so far accrued 310 science points, and is looking to earn 25 more. Here is the new look for the contract system, giving you clear mission goals. In this case, launch a rocket. Now I do wonder how this player managed to get to 310 science without launching anything yet. <laughs> we also got introduced to Dr. Kerry Kerman. I guess Gene Kerman isn't making a return in KSP2, perhaps because of the ties to Werner von Kerman and his somewhat controversial real-life muse? Anyway, Kerry explains that whenever you complete the last objective in a mission, you can return to Mission Control to submit a mission report, where you'll be given a debrief and then handed your sweet, sweet science. I guess this makes more sense than recovering a vessel and then immediately just having the science point. This adds a bit more character to the whole thing. Though, hopefully it doesn't become too much of a chore. I reckon it should be pretty quick though. According to Kerry, it takes just the click of the thanks science button uh, to get your earnings. But how do we get science? Well, I now have this clip to show you. Here we have a rocket in flight and hitting the pause button. Let's analyze. <laughs> First, we have an experiments tab on the left here, which gives you a very helpful message about whether or not there is still science to be earned in a particular location. Very useful when it comes to revisiting areas that you can't quite remember what experiments you brought with you the first time around. It's also nice that we can now see what our biome is without getting a Kerbal out on EVA and doing an EVA report, or running an arbitrary experiment over and over until we see a biome change. Swinging over here, we can see that the rocket has a research inventory. 
This is, I guess, basically a parts manager, but just for science stuff, which I think is a very genuine upgrade over KSP1's contextual menus when it comes to the science experiments. And look, you can see crew observations, and I have confirmation from Nate that no longer will we have to get Kerbals in and out of cockpits to run crew reports. It looks like that annoying feature of KSP-1 is finally being fixed. There are many other quality of life improvements here. Uh, you don't have to get out of the pod to do crew observations. There's unlimited sample storage capacity. You are going to be doing a lot of science collection in the for science update, so we work very hard to make it a smooth process. I think there might be some placeholder text here. This stuff is likely still being worked on and why this update isn't coming out until December, among other tweaks and polishing that will likely need to be done. Let's take a look at the tech tree now. It looks like it's split across four windows, for now at least. I imagine there'll be a fifth and even sixth and beyond windows when things like colonization and interstellar are added. It looks like the top level is the actual progression system, with each tab being required to unlock the next one along, with the tabs below being possibly optional affairs, though in reality are going to be needed to properly progress. Or are they? Perhaps a fun challenge will emerge in the community where you have to get all the way to the end of the tech tree but only unlock the top level nodes. What do you think? Is it doable? I'm certainly tempted to give it a go once you know exactly what parts are contained in each tab. Interestingly, we also have a MUN landing tab, which grants you parts that I don't think are super necessary for a MUN landing, but I guess in order to get to the next tab along, power launches, you'll need to have the MUN landing tab unlocked and have done an actual MUN landing in order to progress to page 2, which aligns with what we've heard from Nate and the team about actually visiting other planets being tied to progression, so I don't think we can just use MUN and Minmus alone to complete the tech tree in KSP2. Oh boy, let's go to Juna! <laughs> Cut to... Yes! Visual thermal effects are present, and I think we can all hopefully assume that heating is in the game as well. Not much else I have to say here really other than that, and a, a, a big old thumbs up. <laughs> as you can see, the Juna payload appears to be a Perseverance Curiosity style rover, and it has science parts to boot. This looks like an equivalent to the scanning arms from KSB-1, and is that possibly a mystery goo containment unit? But wait, in this shot we can see that the scanning arm actually appears to be a sample collection device, meaning that uncrewed missions can do sample returns. I really hope it's possible to transfer samples to other robotic craft so we can do a proper Perseverance sample return recreation. These could even be the same sample return tubes used by this Kerbal here. We also have a better view of that possibly mystery goo piece. What about the science lab from KSP-1? Is it coming back? Well, I think this might be it in this shot here. And here it is again in this shot. That glowy purple part is integrated into the side of it. And that glowy purple part's name? Albert Einz, I mean hydroponics garden, or botany experiment or something. Zooming in on it in this shot clearly shows some plant life in there. Looks like this particular vessel has deployed a small robotic lander down to the surface of EVE. Can't see much with the flames occluding it, but fast forwarding here, we can see it has a nose comb with a little camera inside it. It'll be interesting to see what this experiment is and what it's used for. Is it a simple camera or a more sophisticated scanner or telescope? Let me know what you think in the comments. Continuing with the descent, it appears this lander is also sporting that science junior unit above the heat shield. Now to Jewel. We can see a satellite with a lot of RTGs swooping down over Joule, and it's sporting a magnetometer boom arm, which is attached to a gold block. I actually think this is all one piece, as you can see it here in the VAB part selection. The highlighted part in this screenshot is a radiation survey experiment, which looks like it's present on that same Joule spacecraft. One part I am super curious about is this diving bell looking piece in the middle of the third row. It looks like a diving bell, like a bathy sphere, but I highly doubt it actually is one. But why does it seemingly have no attach point at its base, and why does it have such a large adapter on the top? Is it a smaller lab, some kind of incubator, or something else? Let me know your theories down below, I'm really interested about this one. There's this cute clip of some Kerbals on what I think is Pol, and what's interesting here is that despite this being a crewed mission, the lander appears to have a sample collection arm on it. So maybe this could imply that the samples this arm can collect somehow differ to the samples that Kerbals can collect. Or maybe this was just added to make the lander look more flashy for the video and I'm overthinking this. <laughs> KSP2 will have some sort of story mode. We kind of had this figured out from the appearance of there being an alien race present in some way, thanks to the statues located on Tylo, Juna, and Minmus, all depicting the same ood-looking beings. 
presence of a storyline was confirmed by Nate in the big reveal presentation. And when your missions are complete, you'll be rewarded with extra science, as well as a little narrative excitement. And that right there looks to be the Golden Monarch. Perhaps the lights on it all light up as you successfully land on each body respectively, and then, when they're all lit, something happens. I don't know what, maybe something doesn't happen or something else entirely happens. Uh, I'm really interested in this. I've said that a lot this video. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts on the KSP2 for science reveal. I hope you enjoyed this little meander down speculation road. And if you disagree with any of my takes, then let me know your own thoughts down below. I'm planning to post my super honest, in-depth interview with Nate Simpson on Saturday. So do get excited for that. I asked some pretty tough questions and Nate didn't shy away from answering them. So big props to him for that. I hope you all enjoy it when it lands and I am really happy with it. It features over 20 minutes of news straight from the man himself. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video and big thanks to my Patreon supporters and channel members. Their names are on the left there. And uh, yeah, uh, goodbye, everyone. Great ending. <laughs>